My name is Fedor Zuba. I'm the founder of Winworks. And as a founder of the company, I get asked a, a quite an important question. Where do you see Linworks is going in the future? Where do you see yourself in five years time and all those things? And um, sometimes they act, ask me questions like what motivates you? Or what motivates you to create a system in the first place? So what drives you? All those things that you I can never kind of come up with a short answer or to pinpoint exactly what, why, I'm, why are we doing what we're doing in the first place. So I thought this is a really good opportunity for me to um, try to explain it. Um, well unfortunately, I don't think it's very, I don't think it's possible to kind of explain it in a PowerPoint presentation with uh, like bullet points, this is what I believe. Uh, so came up with a way to try to deliver that message through a couple of stories. Well, let's start with the first story. It's a story of three wise men. Not a very long time ago, and not in, a, in such a very distant land, uh, three wise men were departing from a very important conference uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. One of those men uh, was called Michael Dertosis. He's the head of MIT. Uh, computer science laboratory. Probably one of the smartest guys in computer science in the world. Uh, you have to be to uh, kind of head um, MIT. And what he was trying to do prior to the conference, he was trying to install a simple little gizmo on his laptop uh, so that he can use it for his presentation. So he spent several hours trying to get a little smart card installed on his laptop. Uh, his operating system wouldn't recognize the smart card or the smart card wouldn't activate. So after several hours, uh, he would be presented with things like installation wizard, wizards that ask him questions that literally defy his knowledge of computers. So after several hours, he asked his friend, Tim Berners-Lee, who, as we know, uh, invented internet. So he's the actual father of internet as we know it today. Again, a very, very smart guy. Uh, again, he got to be to invent internet in the first place. So he asked Tim for help, and help uh, Tim throw his expertise to the problem. And after several hours, he gave up, saying that this feat uh, is beyond his capable brain. So Michael and Tim ask for help from their friend, Ron Rivest, uh, the third wise man of our story, for help. Now, Ron is a cryptographer. He's largely credited with bringing RSA encryption into the world. So this is the stuff that we actually use to encrypt internet today. Again, a very smart guy. Um, and he spent with the problem several hours and couldn't get it wor to work. Couldn't answer all of those installation wizard questions that were presented to him. So there they were, pinnacle of informational technology, the bright stars of computer science, defeated at their own game by a smart card installation wizard. Now, the widget that they were trying to use uh, wasn't faulty. The software for that widget wasn't buggy. Uh, the problem was probably due to, I don't know, misalignment of the planets in a cosmos. Or more likely, the problem was uh, due to so-called unintegrated system. So this is where software designers, or the, thing, the people who actually build those gizmos, uh, build the software and the widgets without giving a second, second thought to the world where it's actually gonna operate. When things don't work together, uh, or doesn't work at all, uh, they simply point fingers at each other, saying it's not our fault, it's your operating system, or it's the environment which you're actually running this thing. And then they try to fix that problem with stuffing it with installation wizard, uh, and put as many tick boxes and uh, numerical settings in, those thing, in, in that installation wizard as possible, hoping that a magical combination of those settings will somehow make that piece of software or a gadget to actually work. Now, don't get me wrong, I think technology is great. Um, I'm not a huge advocate of new gadgets and things like that, but I do think it gives us a lot. Um, <coughs> it gave us computers to work and play with, mobile phones to chat with one another and uh, take selfies, internet to access all the knowledge of the world. However, it also requires us to work for it quite hard as well, almost like 
uh, computers are masters of our lives. They demand way too much attention and way too much time of us. Now, we wake up, pick up our mobile phones, and to find a new notification of software update that we must install on that phone, otherwise it just wouldn't work. Uh, then we find out that it needs some kind of app uh, to be installed first, then some kind of hyper-nonsense cable uh, to be attached to that mobile phone of yours so that you can synchronize your files with the cloud. Then you find out that that app doesn't work on your phone. Then you need to find out which version of that app you need to use on that phone. You spend hours and hours and hours trying to uh, basically service, service that little gadget of yours. It demanded to install the update and you spend the whole day <coughs> trying to install that update. That was your weekend, by the way. On Monday, you come to work to find yet another piece of shiny software that you must use. That might have been designed by Lin Systems to begin with, but never, nevertheless, that piece of software comes with a very huge manual, uh, 450 pages of very important information you must read, understand, uh, you know, inside out, uh, because it might contain some very important information about how the system operates. Because every single action as a user, you must know what it's gonna do, because it might affect your business. And software engineers made it simple for you. They highlighted the important bits in that documentation with an exclamation mark. And there are five on every single page. Now, this is the case because we, software engineers, I'll be brave enough to admit it, uh, build the software to solve a very specific problem in the world. I mean, just not in the world, but in general, to, to, to solve a very specific problem. And then we kind of rely on people to service that software, to work for it, instead of the other way around. Now, human-centric computing is one of those terms that was coined by Michael de Tozes after his ordeal with the smart card, and probably many other embarrassing moments with tech that he experienced in his life. And it's all about this fundamental shift of tech, specifically in our day-to-day -day lives, to work for people and not demand so much time and uh, like uh, attention from people to service the, the tech, the, the, our little gadgets. Now, it's happening now, and we can see this all happening all around us. There are companies that are dedicated for that human-centric computing, uh, well, fundamental shift, that, that human-centric computing uh, ideology. We have Apple who are working tirelessly, simplifying things, simplifying our tech and making it work together. All be that only in Apple domain, but still they're working really hard actually making that tech very easy to use for people. We've got companies like Google who are dedicated to cleansing the information, uh, that big data that John Lawson was talking about, and making some kind of use out of it so that it's accessible and understandable by people. We have Amazon that actually brings a very complicated uh, technology to businesses and making it like a turnkey solution. And Microsoft is also working on something. Um, that was a joke and somebody got it. <laughs> well done. Anyway, our tech in our day-to-day -day lives, be that, that this human-centric computing world, like as a direction for the tech industry to go, uh, to, to go after, was said about 20 years ago. Only now we actually see in the results of that work, only now tech is becoming usable for us. It is happening in small ways and with variable degree of success, but it is happening and people are seeing tech as it's actually worth using. You know, the amount of time that it, you know, the demands from us uh, doesn't outweigh the benefits that we get out of that tech. Now the story of a spontaneous zoo. Back in uh, 1999, during the annual so summit of Microsoft, the CEO of that company, uh, built, uh, a dude called Bill, set the direction for the inner workings of his company. He called it a digital nervous system. Now, the idea is pretty simple. He postulated that in order for his business, or in fact any other business, to stay afloat in the coming age of technology and to be able to compete, it needs to digitize everything. So, uh, we take it for granted now, but only about 20 years ago, in many companies, there was a lot of manual processes in place, lots of forms, paper-based stuff. People were exchanging information by sending letters to each other. So, 
Bill said that all the information uh, within the company has to flow through that company in bits and bytes that can be viewed through or vi viewed and looked at and accessed by the Internet Explorer. Uh, I reckon Google Chrome wasn't around back then. <coughs> and Bill didn't set specific direction for all of us to follow. What he was doing, he was reacting to a fundamental change in the way that businesses are operate, in the way we actually live our lives, the way the commerce operates. The thing is, businesses and commerce was going online at the turn of the century. It was going with a big boom. Like that, boom. Now, just like in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, little gadgets, programs, widgets, and systems, and tools, utilities, all this kind of jazz creeps into our businesses, all for individual purposes, uh, but all in the name of propping up that digital nervous system of ours. We must, business is being told, and people are being told, you must replace all the manual tasks that, that we do with uh, automation, with computers, with programs. Uh, we shouldn't have any paper at work. Everything has to be digitalized, in the cloud, blah, blah, blah. You need the app for this, you need the system for that. So, over the time, uh, businesses accumulate uh, lots of different programs within their business. Sometimes tens of different systems and utilities, uh, sometimes hundreds. And in some cases, big corporations accumulate thousands. There are cases where Boeing Corporation you know, did the research and they found out that within their business they used to have, they used to use 7,000 different systems. They all had to kind of work together. <coughs> so this is what I actually called call a spontaneous zoo. It's a zoo of computer programs, all different species, uh, all different habitat requirements. Um, some of them are endangered, and only a few of them left in the world, and they all have to live together under the same roof and be married. <coughs> so, it's a spontaneous zoo. It's a spontaneous zoo because you're not exactly sure how you ended up with it and when did it all happen and what to do with it next. But you got to do something. So you go, uh, you go out and you hire a zookeeper. There are some system administrators in the audience. I'm sorry to call you zookeepers, but there you go. Um, and a whole raft of personnel and staff and very technical people to look after that zoo of yours, to look after the animals, making sure they don't kill each other, uh, they don't kill you, your your business or your customer who actually came to your business to buy a piece of chocolate and didn't quite expect to face with a deadly snake. Now, those um, business systems and pieces of software that we use, uh, they're not exactly human-centric. Quite frankly, they were built by software engineers uh, to, to do a very specific task. They don't know your business. And quite frankly, they don't care most of the time. They just get a system, uh, like a, a, a specification for what it's supposed to do, and they just code to it. Um, <coughs> the system, I mean, the people who build the software, they honestly think that that's the only thing, what they're building, is that's the only thing you will actually use within your business. I don't care how it will actually coexist in the zoo of different systems and programs in your business. So they don't exactly, like, co well, they don't exactly design the system to be, uh, well, with the view that it will even exist elsewhere apart from just doing that specific task. Uh, then they will sell the systems to us, saying that they are easy to use um, and um, <coughs> user friendly, but all, the, all they've done really is they've just rounded some corners of the buttons and allowed us to change the color to, like, say, pink. My bottle disappeared. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> right, so, as I mentioned, the tech in our lives is becoming more human-centric. It is becoming easy to use and kind of, well, user-friendly in the sense that we don't need to spend a whole day to connect our phone to an email anymore. We can do it fairly easily, within about an hour. 
However, the business systems that we use in our you know, day-to-day -day lives are actually going the exactly opposite way. They're becoming more complicated. They're becoming vaguer and more enclosed and still trying to do everything yet nothing in specific. Now with tech, we can see the pattern what actually happened. The tech was simply simplified. Uh, however, we can't really do the same thing with business systems because simplifying the, the stuff that we use within our business will probably yield a very, uh, well, useless piece, of, I mean, useless piece of software. At the end of the day, we rely on this thing to sort of prop, our, uh, prop up our nervous system of our business. It's a quite important thing, so it can't be just you know, a very, very simple thing. So how would I put it, basically? I would put it like this. And me being a software engineer, preaching about how crap we are, about thinking, you know, about actually uh, delivering the system that are usable, it's a bit of a controversy. But I think, as a software engineer of business systems, we kind of need to take a very different frame of mind. Uh, I think that we should think about people, be that individual people, or be that businesses, and then tech, basically. So. Everything that we do have to focus on actually making a human-centric system. <coughs> right, a uh, story of Linworks. This is the, a little bit of a personal stuff. Back, I uh, just want to tell you where it all began and how it all kind of matured into a product that we see today. So back in, um, back in university, I had a bit of a problem. Um, I had to pay for my tuition fees and my living expenses, couldn't get a student loan, so I had to have a full-time job. And to go to that job, to go to work, I had to have a car. Now, I was, I was under 25, and as we all know, uh, being under 25 means that your car insurance costs are measured in numbers that I couldn't quite fathom let alone actually pay for it. So I was buying stuff on eBay all the time, and I thought, how about I just go and start selling little bits and pieces on eBay uh, to make some cash on the side with a single purpose. All I wanted to do is to make some money to pay for the car insurance. That was my only goal in life. So I found a couple of things that I thought people might be willing to buy, and I put it up on eBay, and a couple of months later, I am doing better financially. Well. Uh, insurance company was doing better financially. I was exactly where I started from. But anyway, I realized that a couple of months later, I realized that I'm spending all of my time servicing that little business of mine. It doesn't make me a huge amount of cash, but I'm literally not studying anymore. You know, I might as well be actually walking to work instead, because I would, you know, I'll be much better off. Um, and being a software engineer, I wrote myself a little program to automate all of those little annoying manual tasks that I do. So I wrote a little program that simply connects to eBay, gets my orders, then you know, prints, print, uh, prints uh, shipping labels and things like that, and updates my stock, you know, all the jazz. Um, and after buying something on eBay from a very, very big power seller, I realized that that problem of manual time wasting is not local to me specifically, it's the address on the, pack address on the package that I received was handwritten. So I thought, Many other businesses, many other people are doing exactly what I was doing. Um, and my little program can actually help them out and I can make some money on the side as well. So I put it up on eBay. I did put up my own program to deal with eBay orders on eBay, which is, I think, the great place for it. And um, <coughs> a couple of, I mean, somebody bought it and a couple of weeks later they emailed me to say how it literally saved them from having a nervous breakdown. And they asked me to modify this thing, add this feature to it, and to kind of fit what they're actually doing in their business. But instead of just following their expert software design advice, I asked them a very different question. I started doing, doing that at the very early on. I, did, I, was, I wasn't just following exactly what they're telling me that needs to happen in the software. I was asking them a question. I was asking, what do you do in your business, and what can I make to get computer to make to do it for you instead. So, a couple of years later, there's this backwards and forwards between a few few users of the system that I had. A software product uh, came to be called Linworks. Now, its early success was fully attributed to this one simple fact: that its main objective was 
to save time. And everything that we were doing with the system, we, everything that we were doing with the software was all about this little thing called saving time. Now, uh, years later, we've got something like 50 developers working on the system full time, constantly writing features to it, adding modules, lots of different customers with lots of different requirements, very complicated infrastructure that goes behind it to prop it all up. Now, if you ask me, you're talking about a human-centric system, but is Limerick's human-centric? Well, perhaps not. I'll be the first to admit that it is very mechanical, that it's vague and in places very complex. And we still rely on users uh, to understand the inner works of the system, to actually operate it, which is a nonsense idea. <coughs> However, what I want to say is that the idea upon which the system was built and still in there, in the core of the system, is very human-centric. We believe that a business system, or in fact any system that you use in day-to-day -day life, any software, must be first of all an open one. It must slot into your business natively and naturally, would not be in the way it must enable you to do more with less. One simple thing, it has to save time at the end of the day. That's all it's got to do. It's got to be a human system. All the complexities that we software engineers think that you must be aware of needs to be hidden underneath the bonnet. At the end of the day, it has to do one simple thing as well. It has to enable you to be a better version of yourself, to be a better business. At the end of the day, this is what we're building, and this is Linworks. That's it, the end. <laughs>